The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. <coughs> Here's Joan and Janine okay, everybody. Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is author, actress, Diane Shallot, and neon artist, Lily Lackage. Diane Shallot was born in New York City. She's appeared in comedy, drama, and musical shows, both on and off Broadway. She's acted in feature films, and she's been in more than 100 television shows and specials, with a recurring role of Mrs. Hawkins in Matlock. Diane teaches acting, she does stand-up comedy, and she's written a novel for St. Martin's Press called Grief in a Sunny Climate. Did you stop all of these <laughs> other parts of your life to write this book? You know, there's a curious <coughs> thing. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I thought, how long did this take me? You know, probably, yes. right, like um, <coughs> I say about the book, I'm a 10-year overnight success because the book was always in process. Your whole life is always in process. Uh, so so when you, you didn't stop one thing and write your book. No, it was funny, Joan. I was being interviewed and somebody said to me, uh, you know, it's so difficult for writers to make a living. What else do you do? And I said, I'm so <laughs> lucky to have something steady to fall back on, like acting. Why was this, <laughs> yeah, like acting, right. right? A steady job. Right. Why did uh, the book take the form of fiction when it really was something that was a dramatic part of your life? Oh, it's an interesting question. I don't, I didn't sit down to write in a particular form. I was oh. writing out some thoughts and the journey really led me to, uh, to fiction because sometimes the particular theme of the book dictates the form and sometimes one decides on the form and then you find the theme. But because this woman <laughs> a little nuts and lives in her head most of the time, it seemed that fiction was the logical answer in terms of how to get her story on paper. This woman being the author, Diane Shallot, a no, little the nuts? the protagonist. Oh, I see. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> or as Hemingway says, there's no such thing as fiction. <laughs> you don't right. know where. Where does it come and where does well, it end? Sometimes in the book I thought, is this fiction or friction? <laughs> but this takes a long process because I think you worked with a group in Santa Barbara to, yes, well, to like meet out the subject? Kind of what happened was that I had belonged to a writer's group and the writer's group encouraged me to take the book to Santa Barbara because in Santa Barbara oh, it's I not see. a conference of prizes but really people evaluate the manuscript and wonderful teachers of writing and so on oh, and they were excited about it. But the book was only three quarters finished when I won the first prize in fiction, which is really to encourage the writer. So then I thought, well, now I guess I'm stuck. I uh. won a prize in fiction. I better finish this book. And I did. And uh, the process, though, the actual process of writing was very similar to the process of acting. Tell us, tell us, because I think it's fascinating <laughs> what you did. Well, it's going to make me sound a little <laughs> nuts, Joan, but here goes. All right, I have to preface this by saying that right now, we're talking, correct? But we're not conscious about the words. The whole subtext, as we know, is what's important. In other words, what, as we call it in acting, our intention is the words come as a matter of course. So in acting, the actor hopefully tries to go back initially to what the playwright or the writer, the screenwriter is doing and find the inner life, the subtext in order to find the behavior, because the dialogue is already there, so the actor is the reinterpretive artist. So I thought when I would be sitting typing and stuck <coughs> on a chapter, I thought, well, what is the behavior of this person? So here's where the nutty part came in. Instead of sitting at the typewriter, I would costume myself, I would play all the different characters, I'd get a minimal amount of props, even if I were a guy, you know, <coughs> I'd dress myself in a certain way. Um, but the important thing is I needed to discover 
the veracity of the behavior in order then to write it out. Because you know when we go to the theater or film, we very rarely say, I'll never forget what he or she said. We always say, I'll never forget that moment when she reached across right. and did something. Right. So most writers, um, when they're stuck, tend to think kind of from the neck up. But the point is you want to find what it feels like, what's happening to you. So, I mean, if you're playing a love scene and you're playing two people, you have to be a bit of a contortionist. <laughs> but this is great because now I think the next natural question is, why didn't you make it a play? Why did it turn out to be a book when you're sitting there reenacting that dialogue? It may be. There's some interest in it as a film, and there's some interest in it. Yes, I mean, of course, I've been asked about adapting it into a play. But initially, the thoughts and the behavior are, are, are part and parcel of what this woman in her life in the book, that is, Babe, the protagonist, envisions. Because the book is about a woman trying to find her own identity after her husband dies. And it's not a, a series of mishaps. It's about really coming to terms with her attachment to grief, why she's like that way. But does laughter really mix? As you say, it's, it's not such a heavy book. Does the laughter and the comedy mix with the grief? Yes, because the inspiration was a wonderful quote from George Bernard Shaw, life does not <coughs> cease to be funny when people die any more than it ceases to be serious when people laugh. And again, the I theater, uh, the theater has really been a great teacher for us because Anton Chekhov was asked uh, by Stanislavski in the Moscow Art Theater, are you writing comedy or tragedy? And he would say, <laughs> I'm writing life. You know, I'm writing you life. Interpret it, How right? many of us in our lives have this mix? And what is zany and funny about the book is that you don't know if this woman is kind of skewed and on a bias and bent because of her grief or whether the, her concept of the world has changed because her husband died. So as you can see, there is behavior, <coughs> excuse me, but a lot of that <coughs> is in terms of what she's thinking. So that's why it lent itself to a novel. But it really, it, it really works and it works for you. I don't think I have to ask you what you do uh, to teach because I think you were, very, you were teaching <laughs> us so much just uh. now in a new way of looking at writing maybe. I've never thought of sitting down and talking to myself or, or taking a dialogue. Now, how did it all get started? You were in New York yes. and you had this wonderful, you won this wonderful, uh, what was it? Award event for the for the Santa Barbara Writers Conference. No, when you were in New York, oh, and your oh, career started. That was the very beginning. I the very beginning. <laughs> that was, how much time do we have? Let's get back. I, yeah, I was. Um, well, I graduated from the High School of Performing Arts, but not like fame. We didn't dance on garbage cans. We were very serious, and uh, after the High School of Performing Arts. They were having auditions for the first repertory company that New York and the United States has had since Eva Legallion. And there were 1,500 people auditioning, and I was one of 30 picked out of 1,500. And then we went through an intensive eight-month training program, and then I was asked to be part of the founding company of Lincoln Center with the greats in the theater, Kazan and Bobby Lewis and Harold Clurman and so on. I think it's interesting because you went on then with Robert Lewis to to form this teaching. Uh, well, I'm his associate, yes. Association. Yes. And, and, and how did that happen? I just, from his seeing you so many years ago as just starting out as a young Well, actress. actually, I continued working in New York and did many plays in New York and then uh, came out to California to do a play, Slow Dance on the Killing Ground, and uh -huh. did a great deal of television. And then Bobby Lewis came out to teach, and he's such an inspiration because he's 85. Uh -huh. He's got more energy than anyone I know. And he said to me, do you, th and he has this wonderful kind of John Hausman voice, and he said, do you think I can lure you away from television ah. to teach? And so I did. And so I've 
I'm bi-coastal. I spend part of the time in L.A. and have my own acting workshop, and then part of the time in New York being his associate in well, teaching. The, the great thing, you took us right into television, and you did this recurring role yes. on Matlock. Yes. And do we have a clip from that? I, I think so. Okay, good. Let's see that <laughs> clip, because then we'll see you in action, okay. other than your writing. Uh, okay. Oh, hello, Gert. Oh, look at this. You're into mischief. Just working. You have been to the bathroom without calling for me, haven't you? Well, only just a little bit. How would you know? I know the type. Sir, don't do that. I, I have those depositions just the way I need them. Now, it's going to take hours to get them back the way they were. Don't you have any sick people, Ted, too? I told the doctor about you when he said no work or else. Or else what? Or else a little of this or a little of that. Maybe even a little shot. I'm working on a murder case. Murder one. The only thing standing between my client and the maximum sentence is the best defense I can prepare, and that's what I'm doing. Okay, Gert? Would you like pineapple juice or non-fat eggless custard? Custard. Hey, Gert. Two scoops. Now, don't hang up. Mr. Lewis did manage to pull you away from television, and you <laughs> said... Um, you taught in New York and Los Angeles. What's the is it different? Do you have a dif different teaching technique from no, one there, to the other? There is, as you know, on television, there, the gestures, the the largeness of the character you're playing has to be muted. I think, and we just saw the tape. But the point is that the actual understanding, the psychology, the inner work of the actor, is all the same. I and mean, we tend somehow, in this country, to think, you know, television, film. Uh, <coughs> Right, we whatever a things. writer exactly and and Harold Clerman once said uh, in America if you do many things you're considered a dilettante but in Europe if you do many things you're a renaissance person so we're all renaissance people and uh, if you're creative as everybody is you just find the area you want to work in but as far as teaching on on either coast uh, there's Theater energy is higher than life energy, and it's so interesting because you don't need a course in acting to teach you about energy, but I'm constantly talking to actors about that, actors particularly in L.A. Because Why, get yourself up, is that it? Well, the, actually, the higher your physical energy, the higher your creative energy. Ah. And what happens with actors even very good actors who are playing what we call 10 degrees north and south of themselves for television, the camera's that close, we don't need that kind of energy. I and mean, people always say, why are you talking so loud? Why are you, um. so and I said, I just did a play. You know? That's why I'm talking. But the point is that one is trained that way and you make the adjustment, but you know, somehow with most television, if you hear it, you're arrested by energy because we turn off television when it gets that kind of bland sound uh, of acting. You think that's our interaction with what happens on the screen? That's why talk <laughs> shows, I'll tell you what, that's why talk shows are more interesting and alive because people tend to think there is a kind of style for television and it gets so muted that you walk to the set and you say, I think I'm going to turn up their nothingness. Ooh, don't <laughs> you know? turn us off. Don't turn us off. <laughs> She's taught us to keep our energy up. This was a great acting class today uh, and a writing you. class. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Shella, thanks for being with uh, us. It's a pleasure to meet really. you. Really. And we're going to stay up so you don't turn us off. And we'll be back with Lily Lackage, whose paintings, who's, uh, these are actually photographs of neon work that she's done. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with neon artist Lily Lackage. Lily was born in Washington, D.C., attended the London School of Film Technique and Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. 
Her work has been in exhibitions across America, in Europe, and the Far East. She draws in neon. How do you do that, Lily? <laughs> well, when I was in art school, um, actually I was disliking everything about painting, sculpture, printmaking, except drawing. And um, that was the only thing that, that I liked doing. And then when I kind of learned that you could actually draw in light with a neon tube, that's when I discovered the medium that uh, would interest me for the rest of my life. But how did you realize that? W w was there a class in neon, or no, were you just walking down the street? There was no class in neon. Um, I was being so unsuccessful in, in, in art school and frustrated that I, I spent some time thinking about what it was that really uh, excited me and really interested me and, uh, and decided that all my life I had looked at neon signs in the landscape and that's what I always loved looking at. We used to drive cross country at night choosing the motel by which one had the best neon sign <laughs> right. and so um, <coughs> then I uh, uh, actively sought out someone to show me how to, uh, to to work in the medium went to a local uh, neon shop and of course they said oh you know you've got to be stupid crazy or whatever but they gave me a little scrap of neon to uh, neon tube and a diagram as to how to hook it up to a transformer uh. and then I uh, wired it and started incorporating it into other elements. But we, we talk about your work as being works of fine art, where we think about neon as being so commercial. I mean, neon, you think of Las Vegas, right? Right, right away, the right. whatever the gulch is they call it. Right. But, um, glitter gulch. Glitter gulch, which right. is beautiful. Sure. But it's not anything you'd put in a museum uh, as fine art. Well, now, had people been working as fine artists well, before you started? Uh, neon developed as a commercial medium in, the, uh, in 1910, 1923, the first sign came to Los Angeles. Uh, but it wasn't until the late 50s, early 60s that Chris, a uh, Greek-born uh, artist, came to New York City, was fascinated by Times Square, and oh. started um, using uh, abstracted letter forms as her um, as her art, and she built them in in, in neon. So she uh, was about the first artist to take uh, neon out of a commercial context and into fine art. And she did it uh -huh. by uh, actually using the letter forms themselves. And when was that? It was in the early '60s. It was in the early '60s, and now that you're talking to me, and I'm remind re remembering, Laddie John Dill was also working in neon tubing. Yes, in the '60s. In the '70s. And he, in the oh, it was the '70s. I think so. I see. But he was also changing the colors right. and doing sand and glass right. installations. I forgot about that. Yeah. But that in fact was taken into museums yes. and was thought of as his fine art because there was a, a combination of other work that he had done but your work actually is th the neon work right. I and mean, you use other materials with it don't you metal sculpture let's can one of these explain that one of these pictures well yes like this this piece here it's called drive in <laughs> it's a tribute to Dolores's drive in restaurant uh, it was on La Cienega and Wilshire Boulevard and was torn down in 82 and the bank that uh, occupied the building that was uh, on the site decided to hire a light artist to build a sculpture and so I got the job and I said well wouldn't it be great to do a t tribute to Dolores's drive-in so uh, I went about uh, selecting elements from uh, Dolores's and the outer form made out of uh, aluminum honeycomb aluminum is uh, the form of the ch swivel chairs at the counter I see. the uh, uh, Dolores's was famous for having copper doors with uh, a porthole so that's how the copper came in and the hole and the boomerang from the uh, 50s and of course because it was a drive-in it needed a car perfect so I went out looking for uh, the most uh, interesting car and uh, because my work is bas relief sculpture, it needed to be a flat car, so I settled on the Chevy Bel Air and um, got a uh, shop uh, that was restoring uh, uh, Chevys to cut me off uh, a part of, uh, of a Chevy Bel Air, and so that's, that's the, uh, the piece in there. So it's a combination of, of different colors of metals, copper, brass, uh, aluminum, an actual car part, a tire, and then neon tubes, both on the surface and on the back. So it is a combination yes. of different kinds of work, different kinds right. of material, rather than just a neon sign that you see right. on, the, on the side. And it also has a lot of meaning and depth and uh, research attached to it. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the one right behind you. 
Uh, this was a commission for uh, Columbia Square in San Diego. Uh, it was uh, a building occupied by lawyers, so the title of this piece is And Justice for All, and it's three figures, um, again, mm -hmm. made out of aluminum, copper, and brass. Uh, one has a uh, globe for, for a head, and they're, they're basically... Uh, interacting. It's uh, about nine feet tall. You brought us a clip from KTTV um, showing how a the glass, the process, I guess, right. a glass, but just get, take us through the process a little bit so that when we see the clip we'll know what we're Right, in. well, I, for me, uh, most of it is, is drawing, coming up with the idea and a drawing, and then, of course, I make uh, full-size patterns. Um, mm patterns to cut out the metal, patterns to give to the tube bender. I don't really do uh, neon tube bending. That's another kind of skill that I uh, never developed. But uh, um, once all the uh, uh, materials are, are, are made, then it's all assembled, and that's what the clip shows. Okay, let's see that clip uh, of Lily Lackage. <laughs> I definitely think there's an unexplained magic. The, the beauty of the colors that are achieved through, through neon, the, uh, the light draws people in, you know, much as a moth to a flame. My name is Lily Lockich, and I'm a neon sculptor. I've been doing neon sculpture for 28 years. Uh, I originally uh, began as a result of uh, not liking uh, anything in art school. I was in art school and I hated uh, painting and graphic arts and so I spent some time thinking about what it was that I really loved, really loved looking at and then decided that I'd always loved looking at neon signs in the landscape. Well, I start creating uh, usually with an idea. I uh, have some, some kind of an idea and then I try to uh, work it out on paper, work it out with uh, sketches first and then uh, full scale drawings and then for the tubing part of the sculpture uh, the, the, the tubes are made on uh, a material called transbestos and then that's given to the tube bender to, to make the tubes. Once the tubes are made and the metal work is done, um, I put the uh, neon tubes on the sculpture, wire it, attach a transformer or several transformers, and then light it up. The neon definitely. You know, Lily, your work, you just plug the light in and it lights up. Right. Artists are always dealing with light and sources of light. You must deal with it in a different, with a different idea in mind. Well, I was always fascinated by uh, Byzantine uh, images, things glowing, oh. religious uh, images, and they always tried to make the icons glow by uh, paint or gold leaf or um, uh, tile or some way. With neon, things glow in and of themselves. You have only to, to, to draw it and it actually glows. I mean, the metaphor becomes real. You know, this piece down below um, is mounted on a wall, or any of these pieces, they're mounted on a wall, and yet they bring a glow behind them. Do you also count that as part of the work? Yes, because that's uh, neon tubing on the back of the metal sculpture that creates the auras around it on oh, the it wall. Is. Yeah, so the tubes are mounted on the back and on the front. Oh, it isn't something that just happens naturally. No. It's something that you is part right. of your drawing. Right. Oh, I see. <laughs> I didn't I didn't realize that, but I know that there's always a pattern uh, on the wall yeah. as as, yeah. as well. Um, when you work so much in commissions, I know you got a you've had a lot of awards. Um, California Arts Council gave you an award in the right. 80s and you worked with a team of workers on metro rail i think and you've you've done so many commissions in private collections and mm -hmm. commercial is it easy to come up with ideas for these big these uh, big things these big things <laughs> well um i find it fascinating because it's it's a way of getting into the um 
the, not only the client's head, but the, the nature of the site. And uh, I mean, I, I um, do research. I, I do research on, on the location and on, you know, what, what's required. And, and then I come up with four to eight drawings, so I give them a big choice. Now, is it you easier know? working with a big group of people or um, just like a one it's person? It's never easy working with a big group of people. Uh, probably not in any uh, field, you know, it's always best with with one person who uh, either says yes or no, but I at see. least at least you know I where see. you stand, and and it's not a lot of waffling. What about have you thought of ever working in any other media?s No, Is never. That your stuff? <laughs> I started in this, and I'm going to uh, die, you know, with 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 Nia. It, it just is so. Uh, beautiful to me, and uh, it's really the closest that uh, I can come to a, a religious experience, spiritual experience. I think the, the quality of the light is, is just so um, magical and it mystical. Really is. And when, you, when you think about it, it really does have that. It's mesmerizing. It pulls you right yes. into the piece, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, w one of the, the um, things that you started was a museum of neon art. Right. M O N A. Right. Tell us a little bit about it and why it got started. Is it just your work, or does it oh, help? No. No, oh, it's, it's the not. work. Oh, it's not just my work. No, it's the work of you know all neon artists. We show um, uh, work on a changing, uh, ongoing basis. Um, it started. Uh, I was working as an art director, designing movie posters, and one of the illustrators uh, had a beautiful painting of an old neon sign, and I liked it so much. I said, "Won't you, you know, let me display this in my office?" And so he brought it. And I kept looking at that, and I said, "You know, it's really sad that these signs are being uh, just." Uh, destroyed and, and forgotten, and something really needs to be done to, to turn things around. And so I, I thought, well, the only thing that really would do that is, is a museum that would bring about public awareness, show uh, people what uh, had been done on a commercial level and ah. on an artistic level. So um, I uh, set about to do that, hired a lawyer to do a nonprofit uh, organization, and we started in 1981. So it's a nonprofit museum. It's been going 13 years now. And you have um, both commercial and fine art. Right. We have a collection of both, and we uh, show the work of. 500 neon artists. <gasps> That's great. Well, I'm glad we got to see the one neon artist that I know, or a two, or th you know, I don't know very many, but thanks for being Thank with us, Thank you very us, much Lily. for inviting me. Thanks for being with us today, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to us at 520 South Grand, 8th floor, and we'll see you next time.